by God, were the people to know what hath been concealed from their eyes and become fully aware of the ocean of grace which lieth hid within this divine command, all the people of the world would offer everything they possess in order to be mentioned by him. Baha'u'llah. It is clear and evident that the payment of the right of God is conducive to prosperity, to blessing, and to honor and divine protection. Well is it with them that comprehend and recognize this truth, and woe betide them that believe not. And this is on condition that the individual should observe the injunctions prescribed in the book with the utmost radiance, gladness, and willing acquiescence. It behooveth you to counsel the friends to do that which is right and praiseworthy. Whoso, whoso hearkeneth to this call, it is to his own behoof, and whoso faileth, bringeth loss upon himself. Verily, our Lord of mercy is the all-sufficing, the all-praised. Baha'u'llah. This week, we're really happy to have Dr. Hushman Badi'i, and he'll be discussing the economic and spiritual significance of the law of Wuhula, the right of God. Hushman Badi'i is an academic economist, writer, and researcher with more than 30 years of teaching experience at the college and university level. He's an advocate of spiritual economics. His doctorate research was about Baha'i economics. He's the author of several books, including Spiritual Solution to Economic Problems, Economics and the Baha'i Faith, and Principles of Spiritual Economics, a compilation of the Baha'i Writings. His new book is called The Pain of Crises, The Joy of Victory, and will be published soon. Dr. Badi'i has delivered talks and presented numerous papers on economics and related subjects at various international academic conferences. He's currently a faculty member at the Wilmette Institute and a faculty member of the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, BIHE, in Iran. He's the founder of a Baha'i-inspired enterprise project, a voluntary training program aimed at refugees coming to Scotland. He served as a representative of Bulhula in St. Vincent and Scotland for 10 years. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Badi. Well, thank you very much, Paymane. This is a pleasure for me to be here once again. And uh, I have to apologize because I recently came out of COVID. Um, I'm fine, I'm okay. But uh, I hope that there won't be any uh, crisis during my presentation. Um, I may have some breathing problem, but so far I'm okay. In next, uh, hopefully, 45 minutes. Um, so I was instructed to say a few words about the history of the Baha'i faith and what is the Baha'i faith for friends who are less familiar with the, with the Baha'i faith. Uh, Baha'is are followers of Baha'u'llah, uh, who we believe is a messenger or a manifestation of God for this age, with three basic teachings of oneness of God, oneness of religion, and oneness of humankind. Baha'u'llah teaches us that God is unknowable in his essence. In other words, we know God only through his uh, representatives, that is messengers or manifestations of God. And he has created us equal and has sent guidance to us through progressive revelation uh, throughout the ages. The central figures of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, the Bab, and Baha'u'llah's eldest son and successor, Abdul Baha, have left a wealth of writings and teachings, some of which I will discuss today in this presentation. And if you like to know more about the Baha'i faith, please visit the official Baha'i website at www.baha'i.org. This was a very, very brief introduction to the Baha'i faith. <clears throat> Let me say a few uh, points before I start the main topic. The aim of this presentation is not to compare the revealed law of Allah with those man-made views and models in economics. But we are using them to explore the social function of money with Allah. Also, it should be noted that the Baha'i faith is not an economic system, 
and its founders never claimed to be economic experts. The contribution of the Baha'i faith to economics is mainly spiritual in nature. The goal of the Baha'i faith is to unite humanity and economics is just a means to achieve it. Also, the detailed laws of Ubola are not a part of this presentation. The focus is mainly on the social function of money. There are, of course, representatives of Ubola uh, globally everywhere, and they are a good resource for the clarification of the laws of Ubola. With that introduction, the plan for today and for this topic, uh, we will have the background about Hugola. And then the three important economic principles that dominate the market today are production, distribution, and consumption. In our discussion, we will briefly discuss the impact of the law of Hugola on each one of them. And to have the spirit of the Baha'i writings for these terms, we will use phrases such as sustainable production, that's part two, distributive justice in part three, and moderate consumption in part four. And then at the end, I will focus uh, again briefly on the relationship between Hugo law and contribution, Hugo law and taxation, and we finish with a short conclusion. So this is the plan for this presentation. And for the benefits of friends who are less familiar with this law, um, I should mention that Hugo law is an Arabic word composed of two words, Hugoq, meaning right, and Allah, meaning God, Therefore, Hugullah means the right of God. Hugullah, although a spiritual law, is subject to specific obligations and regulations. The law states that 19% of the surplus income or surplus earnings of a Baha'i, and after all expenses have been paid, belongs to God and should be paid to the head of the faith the Universal House of Justice. The operation of the institution of Google Law is under the Board of Trustee, and the head office is in Haifa, Israel. Google Law is operated as an institution because it requires calculation, administration, the process of payments, and requirements for additional clarifications. There are representatives of Hugo law, as I said, in each country to administer the affairs of this law. In this talk, friends, I will use the term Hugo law or Hugo or the right of God. All three phrases can be used uh, and are used in the Baha'i writings. Although observing the right of God is limited to Baha'is and entrusted to the Baha'i institutions, it is ultimately used for the betterment of the whole society. The rationale of Hugo is that wealth is not accumulated in the hands of a few, but will be distributed in society to be used for the benefit of all. The social function of Hugo law eliminates poverty in the long run and reduces the gap between the rich and the poor. The Baha'i writings clearly tells us about the social function of the law of Hugo law. Here are a few. Baha'u'llah said the Hugo will be used for benevolent pursuits and for the common weal. He also said the Hugo will be used for charitable purposes. He also said that the payment of the right of God is conducive to prosperity, to blessing, and to honor and divine protection. Abdul Baha, in one of his writings, said that every true and sincere believer 
will offer hukuk to be expanded for the relief of the poor, the disabled, the needy, and the orphans, and for other vital needs of the cause of God, even as Christ did establish a fund for benevolent purposes. This is another writing of Baha'u'llah addressed to one of his believers, Zain. He said, O oh Zain, beseech ye God that ye may enable everyone to discharge the obligation of a book. Inasmuch as the progress and promotion of the cause of God depend on material means. If his faithful servants could realize how meritorious are benevolent deeds in these days, they would all arise to do that which is meet and simply. So in this passage, Baha'u'llah refers to the phrase material means for the progress of the faith. In fact, all the teachings of the faith are means for the achievement of the main goal of the Baha'i faith, which is oneness of humanity. Economics and religion also agree that the redistribution of income and wealth is necessary and desirable. Every economist is working towards eradicating poverty, which is the goal of every just government. And taking care of the poor is also encouraged in all faiths. For example, in the Jewish tradition, wealth creation is encouraged and wealth redistribution, including compassion for those who could not help themselves, care for strangers and giving to charity. The Christian tradition of redistribution of income and wealth in dealing with poverty is helping strangers, sharing resources, loving the enemy, providing security for all, and getting the poor back on their feet. Similarly, the Islamic tradition of dealing with the issue of poverty through income and wealth redistribution includes the basic principle of sharing and generosity and also the law of zakat. In the Baha'i scriptures, there are two sets of teachings helping to understand the social function of wealth uh, through the redistribution of income and wealth. One is economic teaching, and that includes profit sharing, a moderate interest rate, progressive income tax, and a universal single currency. And the spiritual teachings are the law of inheritance, voluntary contribution, and the law of Ruhollah. Our focus today is the law of Ruhollah. And if you are interested in other wealth redistribution channels, you may look at the book, Economics and the Baha'i Faith. The ebook is available on Amazon. So friends, we go now to the main part of this discussion. And I start with the concept of law and sustainable production. And I discuss this under three categories of sustainable development and law and input output model and law and the multiplier effect. I try my best to not uh, use the technical terms in this presentation, but at some time, if I use, then I will explain, or later on friends can ask if there is any question. The World Environment Commission defines the sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, a one-dimensional solution adopted mainly through monetary instruments would not effectively deal with market inconsistencies. The law of Hugo law can be considered as a multidimensional approach to deal with sustainability challenges. The phrase sustainable development or sustainability is used with its three objectives, and they are the well-being for this generation, 
the well-being for the future generation and preserving the ecosystem. As it was said, Huwala is a percentage of the surplus income that belongs to God. This means that principles such as trustworthiness and compassion and honesty should be considered and practiced by market participants when deciding on the type of products either produced or consumed. These virtues help individuals own spiritual development. Virtuous qualities have an impact on the behavior of participants in the market to keep in mind the features of sustainability. Abdul Baha states that the trouble with our economics is that its system and application have been purely material instead of material and spiritual. Therefore, a multidimensional approach to solve economic problems is suggested in the Baha'i writings. Also, sustainable production is closely associated with meaningful work. In one of his famous writings, The Hidden Words, Baha'u'llah states that, O oh, my servants, ye are the trees of my garden, ye must give forth goodly and wondrous fruits that ye yourselves and others may profit therefrom. Thus it is incumbent on everyone to engage in crafts and professions for therein lies the secret of wealth, O man of understanding. For results depend upon means and the grace of God shall be all sufficient unto you. Trees that yield no fruit have been and will ever be for the fire. In this passage from the hidden words, it refers to a significant point relevant to this discussion. It tells us that a Baha'i should be an economically productive member of society and produce wondrous fruits. Also the examples of the type of work stated in this passage are those in high demand in the labor market, and as a result, produce higher earnings. Higher earnings put a person in a good position to have higher income, and as a result, a surplus income for paying the hubuk. This second uh, topic, hubala and uh, output uh, input output model is also very interesting. I try my best to explain how it works with the uh, law of Huqallah. In this slide, economic resources, or what we call input, is land, labor, and capital, and output are goods and services produced through adopting a process. The process can be a simple method of producing a product, such as making coffee at home using a coffee machine, to more sophisticated heavy manufacturing, such as a car manufacturer. The economic idea of input-output model can be used to demonstrate the role of Ugola in producing products that are environmentally sustainable, economically beneficial, and ethically commendable. The model shows the process of converting inputs to produce output. In this model, the choice is a process that requires a cost-benefit analysis. We can choose to use all the resources available to us to make those destructive, harmful and unnecessary products for humans and nature, or we can choose to use the resources to produce necessary and beneficial products for us. Once human talent and capability and knowledge and wisdom and moral and spiritual considerations are added to the process of transferring input into output, 
then producing goods and services becomes constructive, useful, sustainable, and ethical. In this model, Huhuola is an ideal principle to help the process of converting input into output. Therefore, morality should be considered as another resource for making conscious choices and should be added to the input section. Huhuola law as a spiritual law can function as a useful principle to have an effect in the process of the input output to produce those products that suit human dignity. In this passage here, Shoghi Afandi, we see that effective process of converting input into output is described. He said that in such a world of society, of course, Shoghi Afandi uh, is talking about Baha'i World Commonwealth, uh, that is in the world order of Baha'u'llah, uh, pages 202 to 204. Uh, Shoghi Afandi is talking about this, this concept. He says, in such a world society, the enormous energy, now here he talks about the means, about the input, the enormous energy dissipated and wasted on war, whether economic or political, will be consecrated to such ends, now he's talking about output, to such ends as will extend the range of human inventions, technical development to the increase of productivity of mankind. It is important to note that the Baha'i principles should not be considered in isolation. They are connected. And for effective use of the law of Hugo law in this model, the consideration of several other teachings would be helpful for an effective process of transferring input into output. The following Baha'i uh, teachings um, may have such effect uh, here. For example, work is considered as worship, women empowerment, the importance of education and training, a consultative method of decision making, and many more teachings that uh, are available. This is from one of my favorite topic in relation to the subject of uh, Huwa Allah. And that is about the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect was introduced by John Maynard Keynes, a British economist in 1936. And it states that any change in the components of economic growth will have a multiplier effect on economic growth. For example, one of the factors that cause economic growth to increase is an investment. Now that can be investment in technology, investment in infrastructure, but my example here is investment in education. For example, if we increase investment in education, say by 2%, Keynes says that the economic growth will increase not by 2%, by, by a multiple of 2%, say by 4% or 6% or 8% or even more. It has a multiplier effect. Now, the social function of the 19% payment of Hugo law has a multiplier effect. For example, an investment in education, which currently hundreds of tutorial schools are operated by Baha'i institutions around the world, promotes the human prosperity and increases society's wealth. Therefore, there would be greater possibilities for community development, for social welfare, and the improvement and maintenance of infrastructure, which in turn will affect the, the entire society. 
Therefore, since the benefits of the law of Hubalah reach the whole society, including the promotion of education and advancement of technology, therefore the law has a multiplier effect. Interestingly, in 1875, Abdul Baha referred to activities that would multiply the wealth of a nation. In The Secret of Divine Civilization, he said, the truths of such physical sciences as are beneficial to man and to widen the scope of industry and increase the products of commerce and multiply the nation's avenues of wealth. Uh, we know that the secret of divine civilization, although addressed to uh, Iranian uh, for the social and economic condition of Iran in 1875, but of course it can be applied to any country with, uh, with similar uh, condition. We go to the next uh, topic, friends, and that is about who law and distributive justice and particularly the social function of wealth and balancing the, the market. Um, I brought this calculation of Google Law and, uh, for the benefit of friends who wants to know how Google Law is calculated. Uh, the following calculation is based on the price of gold on 15th December 2002, the day before yesterday in US dollar. The unit of hukuk is gold. The measurement is mishal. One mishal of gold is equal to 3.642 grams of gold. 19 mishal of gold therefore becomes 69.198 grams of gold. And the price of gold the before yesterday, a 24 carat gold was 57 pounds 40 cents. So if you multiply 69.198 to the price of the gold, that comes to $3,972. And 19% of that is about $755 US dollar. Now, the law says to give 19% of it to God, and enjoy the remaining 81%. Now here is my next discussion. And I think, friends, that the easy part of the law of Google law is paying that 19%. It's straightforward and is based on a simple calculation. The more challenging part is spending the remaining 81%. Now here several Baha'i teachings guide individuals and families in spending the remaining 81%, such as the principle of moderation, contentment, independent investigation of truth, consultation, common interest rather than self-interest, the harmony of science and religion, and having a sustainable lifestyle and, and more teachings. So the concept of wealth also in the Baha'i writings has close uh, connection with the right of God. Here Baha'u'llah states, having attained the stage of fulfillment and reached his maturity, man standeth in need of wealth and such wealth as he acquired through crafts or professions is commendable and praiseworthy. So the stage of fulfillment and reaching maturity in light of this discussion can be interpreted as attaining a high level of human consciousness where the acquisition of wealth becomes worthy if achieved through appropriate means and expanded for the common good. Abdul Baha also describes how wealth should be created or acquired and how to be spent. He said here that wealth is praiseworthy in the highest degree if it is acquired by an individual's own efforts 
and the grace of God in commerce, agriculture, art, and industry, and if it be expanded for philanthropic purposes. Now to balance in our economy, Abdul Baha said that one of Baha'u'llah's teaching is the adjustment of means of livelihood in human society. So this requires a lifestyle change for all market participants. Who Allah can create such a balance? One of the principles of uh, classical economics is that the, market that the market balance itself automatically in the long run. And uh, they, are, they are using the phrase free market economy. And that means it's used to indicate that there is no need of government to intervene. Balancing the market means that the market will be in a state of rest, in a state of comfort when things are in balance. This is what the classical economics, especially Adam Smith in 1776 in his book, The Wealth of Nation mentions and then the concept of free market economy is created. And that the market automatically reach to a balance, to an equilibrium. Power distortion, such as monopolies and all kinds of negative externalities shows that the free market economy does not reach to a balance and cannot maintain sustainability. Dr. Ali, Mar Ali Muhammad uh, Varga, uh, the trustee of Allah, uh, suggests that the right of God can help balancing the market. According to Dr. Varga, the rationale of the law is the inception of an evolutionary process, which in the course of ages and centuries to come, assists everyone in adopting a moderate way of living. He said the law contributes to establishing an equilibrium or balance in the socioeconomic life of those who dwell on the earth, thereby eliminating extremes of wealth and poverty. Now, let's say also a few words about a moderate consumption and, and lifestyle. A, a visionary and creative view is that in an ideal world, according to uh, Dr. Arthur Dahl, those goods and services that are damaging to the ecosystem and do not possess the features of sustainability and are not in line with human dignity will be removed from the market. The list of such unnecessary and damaging products and commodities are many. Much of the present economic resources will be protected once applying the law of Hugo law and other relevant and associated Baha'i teachings, such as advanced knowledge and technology and innovative economic activities will be available for a healthy lifestyle. There is a close connection between who Allah and the principle of moderation. In this formula here, income is divided into two parts. One is expenditures and the other one is savings. And uh, we know that disposable income is the income available to spend or income after all the deductions. So this disposable income is equal to expenditure plus savings. Now, by practicing the spiritual principle of moderation, expenditure comes under control. And individuals and families avoid purchasing unnecessary, unhealthy products that are damaging our health and the ecosystem. Hence, an additional part of the income will be saved. This way, 
the surplus part of saving will reach a level that makes an individual eligible to pay hukuk. The spiritual principle of moderation encourages people to avoid spending on unnecessary goods and services. Therefore, there is a close relationship between huwa and moderation. Now, friends, a few words about the relationship between huwa and uh, contributions or earmarks. The payment of huwa is based on calculations of one's income, whereas contributing to the Baha'i funds is left to the free wish of uh, individuals and uh, their eagerness. Also, the right of God cannot be earmarked for some specific purposes. It is entirely at the disposal of the Universal House of Justice, while other contributions could be earmarked for other purposes according to the wish of the contributor. And a few words about Huwala and taxation. It should be noted that the concept of Huwala is not the same as tax system. Although this is a law, the effectiveness depends on paying with utmost joy. However, taxation is compulsory and imposed on individuals. In this way, Huwala cannot be considered as a tax. Also on tax, as it is compulsory and progressive and collected by force, discouraging some people from earning more than a limit or in many instances, avoiding paying tax. However, huwala, as it is paid by joy, it is a spiritual obligation and brings blessings it inspires people to become productive members of society and earn more to be eligible for the payment of Uqala. Now, friends, the law may be required clarification in one area. For example, as some friends asked this question, a question may be asked, would those Baha'is whose income does not reach the level to be eligible to pay the right of God, to be deprived of receiving blessings and divine protection, particularly as they may never have the opportunity to reach to such level of income throughout their life, mainly in villages that there is less movement of money. Now, in response to this inquiry, I will consider the following clarifications based on the Baha'i writings. First and foremost is that this law, according to Baha'u'llah, is to purify one's riches and earthly possessions. Therefore, it can be stated that those who do not have riches do not need to purify them. Secondly, those whose surplus income has not reached to a level to be eligible to, be, to, to pay huwa law are exempt from this law and continue to receive blessings. Thirdly, this law is indeed kindness from God as the money will be used to help the people who cannot pay the huwa. Baha'u'llah in several of his writings denounces any perceived lack of love for the poor. Fourthly, if there were still any doubts about the position of the poor in this regard, Baha'u'llah further affirms that those that are unable to pay will be invested with the ornament of his forgiveness. And last but not least, Baha'is can pay any amount under the category of Huwala contribution. So friends, in conclusion, I like to say a few words about the function of money from an economic perspective and related to 
حقوق و law and other sources of funds such as general contributions and earmarks. From an economic perspective, the important function of money as a means is when it creates economic activities. Money is worthless if it does not be instrumental in improving economic development. Money is used throughout an economy to buy goods and services. In the process of movement or circulation, it enables businesses to pay for salaries, maintenance and tools and other things necessary to sustain business growth. As companies grow, they create new jobs and pay taxes that the government requires to perform their, its objectives. Therefore, we see how important it is when money is in circulation rather than accumulated or unemployed. And of course, we know that the notion of unemployment is not only for human resources. Land can be unemployed. Money can be unemployed. Technology can be unemployed. Now, Baha'i funds, including Huhuqala and general contributions, can be a part of the process of creating economic activities. Every time money changes hands, it causes economic activity. Let's look at the way Baha'i finance is working. For example, general contributions start from the local Baha'i communities, such as at the 19th day feast, which is managed under the supervision of uh, the local spiritual assembly. A part of this fund is spent on local activities, which the whole community benefit, and the part is transferred to the national fund for various activities at the national level. Similarly, a part of the national fund is sent to the international fund to be spent for activities globally. Now, suppose there is a shortage of fund at the local or national level. In that case, the funds are allocated from international funds for activities in various parts of the globe. In all these movements up and down, the funds are in circulation, changing hands and creating economic activities. Funds are not accumulated, but are in circulation, are in movement. Therefore, the use of the fund from Huwala has become the cause of various economic activities locally, nationally, and globally. And the key principle considered throughout this process is the belief in the principle of the oneness of humanity. Thank you very much, friends, and I hope this was useful uh, for, for all of you. And thank you for inviting me, uh, Paymone. Thank you so much. That was really interesting to get both the economic side and the spiritual side. Um, thank you so much. So yeah, everyone can put their questions in the chat now. So the first question is, my father always talked about needs versus wants in regards to payment of huwala. Any thoughts on this? Yes, this is very important question. Thank you for asking that. Um, the first thing we should know, friends, that um, nobody is there to ask us to pay Huwala, except Baha'u'llah. <laughs> so nobody is there to come to our house and tell us, hey, have you paid your Huwala? It is our duty, and we have to pay with utmost joy. And because it is with utmost joy, what are my necessities and what are my luxuries, I decide about them. So it is up to individuals to calculate their own huwala. Even when we come to the calculation, 
So in the calculation, what are my needs? In what country I live? What kind of job I have? What is the size of my family? In what age I am? You know, so my necessities and my luxuries are different at different times in different countries, depends on my income. So those are the things that we have to decide ourselves. And for every individual, necessities and luxuries are different. For some people, a luxury item may be a necessity. That's up to that person to decide. Some people have simple life, even when they are rich. Some rich people have a poor life. You know, so these are the things that every individual should, should decide about themselves and what are the needs and what are the wants. Uh, wants are usually the luxury items, needs are the necessities, and this all depends to the size of family, you know, uh, the country you live, the income you have, and the, the, your, your, the, the behavior of us towards, towards goods and services, you know, the behavior of us. How, how we react towards new goods and services come to the market, you know? Let me say one story, and this is actually from Los Angeles. A few, a few years ago, I uh, visited a friend, um, old friend, and uh, so uh, he had a construction on top of his garage. He was building something, and he said that that cost me eighty thousand dollars to to build a big room up on top of the garage. And when I looked at his house and the family size, you know, and, and I said, "Why? Why you are making that? I mean, you have a big house, you know." And he said, "Hushman, we have so much leftover that that room is a um, a store." for our leftover downstairs. That is a store, you know? So the life people have different life, you know? Spending 80,000 pound dollars to, to, to make a room as a storage because there are so much things are, are there. So, and some people have very simple life, you know? We lived in, in Bangladesh and uh, we lived among the poor people. And I always say that we cannot define poverty. If we want to know what is poverty, we have to live with poor people to know how they are living. And we lived for 10 years among poor people in Bangladesh, very simple life. They were very happy, you know, they were so hospitable. Um, so the life is different for people. So we have to decide about our own life. And, and we should not interfere with other people's life. <clears throat> is there a specific spirit in which people should be paying Hovula or does it not matter? With joy. <laughs> with joy. Bahá'u'llá doesn't need our money. You know, he has the entire world. It belongs to him. You know, that 19% is a blessing for us. Uh, so we have to uh, pay with joy. If we are not paying with joy, Baha'u'llah does not need our money. You know, Baha'u'llah does not need our money. It is our need to, to have more blessings uh, for us. It is for us, not for Baha'u'llah. He is giving us an opportunity. He is giving us a chance to be a part of the world order of Baha'u'llah. And once we consider the money that is paid to Baha'u'llah, what is the purpose of that? Baha'u'llah uh, says in one of the writings that the money is spent for building the world order of Baha'u'llah. So we will be a part of that. Um, do you know if there's an address if someone wants to send a check? Well, uh, not talking about who or love, but if you want to send money, just send to me. I need some money. <laughs> um, that is, again, another question. 
that you should you should refer to your representatives in your area. Uh, even I don't know when I was a, a representative of Hugolah in Saint Vincent, we could get uh, we could receive money from from friends. Uh, here in England, we can't. I mean, friends have to directly send to the National Spiritual Assembly or uh, uh, airmarking to Hugolah to the to the World Center. Uh, in each area, you have to ask your representatives how the payment should be should be done. Again, that I am not in a position to to answer that question. Um, should paying Hugola be paid before contributing to the Baha'i funds, or does it not matter? Yes, Hugola is should be paid first. Is the priority is with Hugola, and then any kind of contribution. And the amount of contribution we pay is not a part of Uwala. We cannot calculate that and say, I have, I have already paid uh, contribution and we deduct from Uwala. Uwala is completely separate and is the priority. First Uwala and then contributions. Is it wrong to pay just directly 19% of someone's salary? If it is surplus. Yeah, surplus, 19% of the surplus after all expenses. That's the statement we have. So how, how much it is, you know, one of the things that, uh, that's my experience, experience uh, uh, of the East and the West. You know, in the East, people behind go more, more with the spirit of Hugola. Um, I should not generalize that. You know what a lot of friends like to look at the spirit of the Hugola. In the West, I noticed that friends go more with the calculation of Hugola. I mean, it again, there are two different views on that. Um, but as representatives of Hugola, we always we were guided that education of friends at this point is very important. To understand the concept of Uwala is the spirit of Uwala. Calculation, of course, is important, but the education of friends uh, is important. So if someone, after doing the calculations, shows that they have no excess, but they still feel like they can afford to pay Uwala, can they do so? Yeah, any amount. Any amount can be paid in the name of Uwala contribution. And that give a chance to all Baha'is, doesn't matter they are poor or rich or any, the Hugola contribution is there and they can pay any amount. The story I wanted to say was about this, but let's have those two questions and I will tell that funny story. Yes. Is payment to the fund considered part of our expenses? <laughs> That's again up to individual, I mean, Individuals should decide. Uh, I mean, yeah. Next. What if you worry that paying Hulula takes away from needed savings for retirement? Well, that's again something that individuals should decide about that. I mean, we are talking about Hulula should pay it after all the expenses. And when you are, we are talking about expenses, what are these expenses? We don't want to have a miserable life during our retirement. So these are the things that the individuals and families should consult about that and and and, and see. Uh, yeah, we have to we we don't want to um, suffer uh, materially during our retirement. So these are the things that should be calculated and considered. We want to have a happy life. We want to have a, a you know, a life, especially Baha'is like to teach the faith. You know, teaching the faith has also those those things should be considered. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these questions that uh, I know that's what I don't want to involve myself in those type of questions. These are the things that individuals 
can uh, can make their own decision. Uh, and of course, the writings are the, the wealth of writings are available. And I am sure that again, uh, representatives of Huvala will be a good resource uh, to talk, to consult, you know. <clears throat> okay, those are all the questions for now, so you can say your story. Okay, now this is a uh, this is a story that happened in St. Vincent. And uh, we had a new Baha'i, a new Baha'i, a wonderful Baha'i. I mentioned his name, Besmin. Besmin was a new Baha'i. And he was a gardener. So one day he was working in our neighbor, you know, on a daily basis. And I asked Besmin, if tomorrow you're okay, come to our house and we have a small garden. And, and work here. And he said, okay. Now, Besmin is a new Baha'i two months, you know, only two months. So he came and started working <clears throat> and uh, $40 was his uh, wage and I paid him and did some calculation with his finger, you know, and paid me about $6 as far as I remember. And he said, this is for Coca-Cola. And then I said, okay, you want this uh, as a refreshment for the feast? He said, yes. I said, okay, I will give to the caretaker of the Baha'i Center to buy Coca-Cola and for the refreshment in the feast, which was a couple of days. So I gave the money to the caretaker. I said, buy a case of Coca-Cola and please mention that this refreshment is from Besmin. So we had the feast, Coca-Cola was served. And then after the feast, we were outside and Besmin came to me and he said, Hushman, that money was for Coca-Cola. I said, yes. So we bought Coca-Cola in your name. And he said, no, Coca-Cola, that 19%. <laughs> then I understood because I couldn't believe that the two months old Baha'i know about 19% who Allah. I couldn't think about that. So, and also the pronunciation was Coca-Cola and I thought so. So, but that was for Hububala. And he worked the same day and the same time he gave his 19%. So that's what the House of Justice have this uh, category of Hububala contribution that we can pay a part of our salary, whatever amount it is in the name of Hububala. And that actually give a chance to all Baha'is, whether they are poor or rich, you know, especially in villages that I said that usually money is not available in the village. You know, there is less movement of cash in villages. So that gives a chance to all Baha'is anywhere in the world to contribute to Allah as who Allah contribution. <laughs> That's, I did not expect that story to go in that direction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. But, but if you want to contact me about economic issues, yes, my email is available. And, uh, and those two books are in uh, on Amazon, Economics and the Baha'i Faith, and uh, the, 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 the subjects uh, that... Uh, um, are not discussed, you can find all in that book, uh, a compilation of Baha'i writings, uh, some principles of spiritual economics uh, with over 700 passages from Baha'i writings uh, are available in that book in every aspect uh, as far as I could gather. And I'm sure that there are more, uh, but that's also uh, available. 
Great. Thank you. And we'll post the links to that when we put this on YouTube. We'll put the links to your books in the description if anyone wants to check it out. <clears throat> yeah. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so our speaker next week will be Mr. Russell Ballew, and he'll be talking about Return of the King, How Baha'u'llah's Revelation Fulfills Prophecy. So okay. these are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I've put the link to our YouTube channel and contact form in the chat. And we'll end with a Baha'i prayer today. O oh God, my God, illumine the brows of thy true lovers, and support them with angelic hosts of certain triumph. Set firm their feet on thy straight path, and out of thine ancient bounty open before them the portals of thy blessings, for they are expending on thy pathway what thou hast bestowed upon them, safeguarding thy faith putting their trust in their remembrance of thee, offering up their hearts for love of thee, and withholding not what they possess in adoration for thy beauty and in their search for ways to please thee. O my Lord, ordain for them a plenteous share, a destined recompense and sure reward. Verily, thou art the sustainer, the helper, the generous, the bountiful, the ever bestowing. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <clears throat>